Welcome to The Truth in His Heart. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today I am thrilled to engage in a captivating conversation with my next guest, an extraordinary multifaceted creator who has established a profound impact in the realm of art and self-expression. Uh, he creates abstract art using bold colors, shapes, and textures. Please welcome Santos Shelton. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here and uh, share my story. Um, yeah. Appreciate it. And more essence to share your story. I like that. Say, I, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> so, th and thank you. Thank you for making the time and, and, and being flexible. Um, you know, we, we've been, we were trying to get this to happen. You know, I've had my things, you had your things, but we're here now. And, and, and that's, yeah. that's great. And um, so to start off, like, you know, we were joking a little bit earlier, talking through a little bit earlier, sort of like socializing. I feel like it's a class socializing as a superhero. So mm -hmm. I like to go with the sort of origin story of where creatives and artists, where they they kind of start. Like what was that spark, if you will, like, you know, starting out, was there something that you can look back at when you were younger and like, that's when I realized like art was a thing or that's the first thing I did creatively and it still kind of shows up in my work today. So sort of setting the stage, you know, share one of those early art experiences for yourself. Um, I started, you know, love for anime and comic books, um, 80s, 90s kids. So I did a lot of copying and, you know, I was also into, you know, graffiti stuff as a teenager and, and lettering and all that. But I, I think for me, uh, a catalyst of what really birthed my my love for art was was actually in high school taking art school classes and, and really art for me was something I copied but also became something that I needed to express myself with and I think with the issues that I had growing up as a kid um, and how I grew up it became a necessity and so that was a huge I think solidification for me when I was around 17 or 18 was being able to express some of these frustrations I was having as a, you know, a kid from a working class home, a kid with, you know, abuse in the home, a kid who um, was also, you know, a bit other, like, you know, in, in the town I grew up in, there wasn't a lot of uh, black kids at my school. And there also wasn't a lot of mixed black kids at my school. So I think a lot of those things translated into, um, you know, at the time, uh, lots of colors and abstractness that I like to use still today in my work, which is this element of emotions and, you know, releasing our emotions. And um, yeah, I think for me, that's what even today pushes me forward is this connection with, I think the therapeutic part of art and the catharticness of just being able to, you know, when you can't say what you feel and you can't know how you feel, but you can let it out in some type of creative outlet. And that allows you to kind of get a grasp of what you're experiencing. Um, and for me, that's that's been there since the beginning and why I've continued uh, to this point. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. I mean, um, and, and, that, and that's great. It's, it's great to always kind of start off like not quite in the beginning. It's not quite that, but it is definitely something that gives us some sort of credence. And, you know, I think in, in looking at sort of that that origin story, if you will, if I were to backtrack when I started, you know, podcasting or recording audio, what have you, it was in high school as well. So definitely is something that um, sticks out of. I, I was just talking to some folks about it earlier, about me walking around with a little click mic, you know, hey, so tell me about what the school year has been like. And now I'm doing a version right. of that, speaking with, you know, creative folks and artists, folks that are much more talented than myself, but, you know, making myself look good. So it's, it's great. <laughs> I, I, I think what you do is, is, is a pure unadulterated talent as well uh, oh, of communicating and, and pulling, pulling, allowing people to feel comfortable where they can express and, and, and is, is a talent that I don't think a lot of people have or, or respect all the time. So that's um, very kind of you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, you know, I, I have in the, the sort of introduction, the, you know, the, the copy and paste from directly from the bio, ripped from the headlines from the bio, but I think something is always lost in that. So if you will, for the, for the folks here listening that are, uh, you know, going to be listening to this episode, share with the folks, like how you the, describe your work. And I, and I say this because you know how often you have artists and they have the artist statement. And sometimes it's just like, 
what is your art about though? So, you know, give it to us all, right. give it to us uncut. Um, yeah, I think the artist statement always changes and it's not something that like is solidified. And for me, um, at this point, my work is, um, it's, it's the way for me to channel emotion and to talk about things with trauma, abuse, racial, class, racial experiences, class experiences. Um, and I use my creativity and also my imagination as tools to, to work with these, these topics. So for instance, like my work is, is centered around uh, things with trauma, but I like to use storytelling in, in terms of sci-fi. Um, some of the paint, a lot of the paintings I have are based off of these fictional characters that represent real people to me, that represent real issues to me. Um, and they're a way for me to communicate these ideas and these experiences in a more palatable way for someone to not necessarily be right away offended by some of these things, but to be open to the experience. And so I found a mirror with that and especially sci-fi uh, and, and seeing uh, how that can be used as a tool to educate and to make people feel seen and to get points across that I think sometimes are, are, are often stuck to just being something that's non-fictional or something that has to be wrapped up in this very, like, I think, you know, a mirror of what we already experience in life, which is, you know, uh, non-fiction. Um, so that, that's what I say is it's, it's like, a, like me telling me kind of communicating to people these through my, my work, yeah. how trauma affects us, how we grow from it, how we change from it, how we, um, become better people from it or become worse people from it. Um, and that's the centerpiece of my work is really to use that along with the abstract, the colors, the, the storytelling to all come together into a cohesive experience, if you will, for people to kind of get a mirror for their own experiences in their own life and maybe things that they want to change or maybe things they need to grow from. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, since you, you touched on color a little bit, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask it, even though mm -hmm. it's in my rapid fire questions, I, I'm telling you that right now is in there, but, uh, so I'm going to modify it, but, um, you know, I've noticed like with, you know, the, the, the images that are in your, your, the background behind you, that blue pops up a lot and it's in there. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so speak on that, speak on sort of the, the, the meaning of how you, perceive and present the, the the color of blue like what does color you know represent in terms of emotion or in terms of feeling or what are you trying to convey with that use of that color because directly behind you is different shades of of blue and you know i get a sense of it i get a sense of multiple things i'm seeing in there but i don't want to be an art nerd right now or try to be an art nerd so i'll let you speak on that um Color, I mean, I, I took graphic design in college and in and, and graphic design, you, you really learn that color is, is, you know, the bulk of why we get even attracted to things. It's, you know, even, you know, things like the McDonald's logo and, and, and stuff are used in order to attract you in a certain way. And so for me, color is a really strong, prominent thing in my work. And um, especially um, if you notice in some of my work, even the painting behind me, uh, there's blue along with colors of red and other tones. And that's because I have just this experience that, you know, um, we go through a multitude of different emotions through in one day, let alone in an hour. And so how does that visually look like? And I think blue is often, to me, like if you see a character that's blue or wrapped in blue, is this type of persona that we have out walking in our daily life, which is like, hey, you know, they could be like, hey, Rob, how are you doing? And you're like, I'm good. I'm good today. But really inside, maybe you're not that good. Mm -hmm. And so to me, a lot of blues and the reds and the tones are to kind of symbolize that multitude of emotions that we go through and how what we're projecting isn't always what we're feeling inside. That's good. That's good. That's, that's so good. <laughs> um, and I like that you mentioned the uh, the sort of branding conversation, the McDonald's thing. I, I, I have marketing background. That was my you know background in college. And I took a few extra classes. And I was like, hmm, all the fast food has these, hey, come here. They're different oranges and reds and yellows. And I was like, I see what y'all doing. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, so the, those golden arches are, are there to pull you in, man. Definitely. <laughs> so... Is, is there like one, you know, one life experience that that really sticks out and that it kind of help, you know, and you were touching on a little bit earlier, but I want to go a little deeper. Um, 
a life experience that, that sticks out that kind of like, you know, directed or influenced your, or shaped your creative sensibility. Like, um, you know, parents, you know, working class doing all of this sort of different stuff and work ethic, not really getting sick, not taking a lot of days off, really just doing the thing that you're doing and putting all your effort into it. That's the thing that I think coming up kind of crap, uh, directed how I go about what I'm doing, whether it is in sort of the day job or even when doing this creative pursuit, you know, it's just like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to put everything I have to it almost to a fault, you know, because mm. that's, that's the way I'm built. That's the way I'm kind of wired. So is there mm. an experience that, that sticks out for you that's has shaped your creative sensibility? Um, yeah, I mean, I would have to probably be like a lot of my 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 work ethic comes from my parents and, and um, you know, my dad was a truck driver for 15 years, um, which in, in my town, there wasn't a lot of black truck drivers, uh, let alone um, I, I've yet to meet uh, hardly anyone who's had the experience of their their father or their mother being in, in that industry. But it, it, it you know, my dad would get up sometimes two or three in the morning, come home, you know, seven at night. And I think for me, um, that has been a strong push in how I've worked is, is this mentality of like, you know, I'll die. I'll just sleep when I die, you know, in, in certain aspects. But I've found out that the older I get, I'm starting to reach this equilibrium with that, with, with knowing, with the more I'm getting more settled in who I am as a person, the more I don't feel the need to push myself to work as hard, yes. which may be counterintuitive to what people think in terms of like reaching for your goals. But I think there's a balance between you pushing yourself or pushing yourself to the point of exhaustion or pushing yourself to the point of where you're no longer necessarily, you know, you're, you're, you still have a passion for what you're doing, but the work of it is overtaking the, the, the love for it, or maybe even the direction that you need to go. Um, and I think that's something that I've been very sensitive to, sensitive to lately is, is what is that balance for me? Um, and, and, you know, we can easily look on social media or, or see, you know, the next person open and like, it's Sunday and they're still doing work. <laughs> yeah. uh, man, maybe I should work. And I think that's something that comes counter counter just intuitive to, to being a, a person trying to strive for something is we look at other people and we're like, wow, look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. They don't seem to sleep. Um, and I guess I'm not going to sleep either. And I think that's the balance I've started to find is that me sleeping is work. Me taking time out to sometimes even watch a, a film that's inspirational. The story of it is work. And so to change the narrative in myself that, that just because, you know, uh, Saturday I end up you know, zoning out and playing some PlayStation or I end up doing something that's not necessarily conducive to someone thinking, oh, you're on it all the time. But actually, no, I am. I am on it. It's, 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 it's the, the, that, that balance is kind of weaved in now into my work schedule along with like, all right, you need to, <laughs> today you need to like paint, 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 yeah. paint. So yeah, for me, it's, it's a balance, I think. And I think that has come for me just as I've gotten older to realize that like, um, what I do work on is dope and it doesn't necessarily need that much refining. Sometimes it needs me to be patient and allow me to let it do what it needs to do, you know, which I think is, is a really hard thing to do too, is to be patient. So. I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, and yeah, I, I relate to that. I, I felt seen there where you were describing it because it is, you know, definitely you start looking at things and maybe this doesn't fit, but I, I think it does where I look at it as, this is all process. This is all going into me delivering whatever it is. So mm -hmm. if I need to travel for sake of argument to go to a different sort of art city or art environment to feel that sort of inspiration, I, I can justify that in my head. It's like, okay, I'm getting different context, different reference, having different conversations with folks. So when I go back and I engage back with these interviews, I have a different, I have a more rich perspective i've added to my perspective but mm. i'm not putting out content i'm not you know being um active on on instagram or what have you because i think there's something about that it's something about that sort of making art or making work um doing something creative and in producing content there's something you know there's something that's gotten really muddy with that and mm -hmm. you know this this notion of you have to do so many posts in a given week, right. To, to get attention, to, to be able to share it, to show what you're doing or what have you. Cause you know, that's, that's one side of it. But if you're, you're, you're working on something, 
it might not be something that you want to show a part of this during a given week or a part of this on a given day. You want to just maybe show right. this is the idea. And now this is the finished product. And I'm too busy working on it to actually document it and show it in this way. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, uh, I, I, I really love Kendrick Lamar right now because, um, you know, uh, I love his I love his his music, but I also love his perspective he comes from. But um, there was an interview I was reading about him talking about just how you know I think in terms of like artists or or what have you, we don't always see ourselves in other genres. But as the musicians, they take time out. They take time out. He was talking about how he just took time out to to really his next album. He wanted it to like really set and his, with his experiences. And you know, I'm sure I don't. I'm not Kendrick Lamar, so I don't have no one like you know, calling me up, hey man, where's the next album? But I'm sure he had pressure to produce something. And I think for him to sit back, for any creative person to sit back and allow your past creative experiences to settle in, to calcify, to see what you learned, what you can do, what you can do better. It's time that is very precious. And sometimes we don't give ourselves that time to look at what we created. And we're just so busy trying to create the next thing, the next thing, or do the next thing without giving that time to look back. What did I just do? I just for two years. What have I been doing for two years? What have I been doing for five years? Do I like what I'm doing? Do I like the direction I'm doing? Do I want to continue doing this? And I think those are really strong questions that allow you to sometimes not get burned out. Um, and I, I just took a, a month or so off of of Instagram for that same that 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 same idea is to pull myself away from. Not, not, I wouldn't say people, but to pull myself away from this this machine that wants me to keep producing something, whether I feel like I want to do it or not. And I think you're right. It it, it does get muddled up in this feeling of wanting to be seen, wanting to to stay connected to people who are following what you're doing, but also feeling this this need for a balance of like I need to like you know take a month or two off to to reassess my life, to maybe go to the beach or to maybe you know, really sit down and see where I'm going with this and where I want to go further. But, you know, I think in, in this day and age where everything is always on, where everything is like, what's your next project? Or what are you doing next week? Are you going to a coffee shop to work on it? What, you know, I think all these things that get pulled into to a lot of media is something we forget that we can control, that we can decide how much we want to share, how much we want to convey and and I, I believe that the, the, there's a great power in stuff still being mysterious. Like I love sometimes seeing a, an artist or, or a musician, how they created everything. But then sometimes I like just seeing the finished product and wow, how'd they do that? You know, and I think sometimes you lose a little bit of that when you're too caught up in trying to show everything all at once or to be on all the time. Or even for, for, for you know, something I'm adamant about is, is, you know, for creatives to just be like, hey, um, I'm taking this month off for my mental health and I'm not creating any work, but I appreciate all your support. Bye. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just even, I think that gives so much levity to other people who are creative that, Oh, look at this person who may be in a position that you think is higher than you, or maybe you think that you want to be in while wow, they're taking a break or they're like, not, you know, falling into this, this, I would say social media trope of doing these certain things to, to get more followers. So I think, you know, it's, it's, you know, we all have to be sensitive to what works for us. And I think for me, uh, social media doesn't always work for me. And I think it's just become a model for a lot of people who want to do something in their life to create a, uh, a template, you know, to create something with. But also, I think we have to th figure out how well it works with the way you want to do things and not necessarily, um, you know, Google like, what are the 10 best ways to increase my Instagram followers? It's like, no, maybe think about like, you know, what exactly you want content you want to do. Not necessarily you have to, you know, adhere to anything, but that's a hard thing to do. And I, I can't really tell anyone else what they should do. I just know for me that I need a break from that stuff. Sometimes I need a break to really think about why I'm creating, who am I creating it for and what is the purpose of it? Because sometimes it could feel like I'm creating this painting today because I want to post it <laughs> because I want a few people to like it and do, and do all this. And that'll make me maybe feel accomplished for the day, but in the, you know, it's not a long term. It's not, it's not something that I think is, is sustainable in terms of energy and power. So, yeah. There, there's, there's research around it that says that those likes or that engagement is a dopamine hit. 
You know, it's it's yeah. literally an addiction thing. And, you know, we we get caught in that loop. And, you know, I've come to that recently where, you know, I, I try to be in the scene and I'm told, oh, you're a creative, you're an artist, you're all in. And it's like, that's that's cool. I, I don't know. And I might have a question that relates to this later, but I I, I don't know where I fit in it. So I find myself because I, certain things just feel sort of fake and a little too Instagram, but in real life that I try to avoid those situations because I don't like them. They're not serving me. And I find that I do more of that because I'm like, this is the thing that I'm told I should do as far as attending mm-hmm. this thing, going here, talking with this person. But I realize that the folks that are the sort of people in that zone, maybe the gatekeepers, maybe even the, the artists at times, are like, oh, yeah, you're an influencer. I say, no, 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 no. I, I shy away from that. Mm-hmm. Like, I mm-hmm. not to knock those those folks, but it's not what I see what I'm doing as. I, I don't see it as an influencer thing. So I don't need to be at every opening. I don't need to be at every like art walk or what have you. I try, try mm-hmm. to get very uh, restrictive as to where I put my time. Um, because mm-hmm. it's at a premium and you want to be able to have sort of that good energy. You know, I I find like if I pop over to a thing and I'm like, oh, let me check this out. I don't need to, I don't want to feel like I have to fake it to feel like I'm fitting in. I'd rather, you know, check out the art at my own pace, go there when no one else is there, preferably, and be able to take that in, absorb it and appreciate it versus feeling like I'm on display for whatever sort of this social media to IRL loop there is because just doesn't really fit for me mm-hmm. from from this sort of mental health component. It's just like I come out of these situations feeling less confident than when I went into them. Mm-hmm. So let's see. Uh, I want I want to go back a little bit because um, I, as I didn't ask, I should have asked. Uh, let's talk about process a little bit because I got a couple more questions after this. But definitely, I want to key in on process. Where where do you start, and um, and and how do you start? Um. So for me, I. I believe a lot in, 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 in creative practices of muscle, <laughs> like you have to work out, work it out. And so um, I'm very adamant about trying to sketch and stuff all the time, um, which, you know, I've, I've now I, I work electronically. So I work with colors and I kind of like look at what colors I'm feeling. And, and, and usually I, I tend to stick to certain colors uh, for a certain period of time, like right now, I'm really into like reds and purples because I'm doing something based off of lava, a lava planet, and in, um, in the series that I'm doing. But um, I start, I start off with just kind of letting these colors show me what this being is. You know, I kind of let the colors and the abstract and kind of just playing around. Kind of, you know, it, it can to like, you know, I really like Pollock and how he would just sit there and just, you know, drizzle stuff around. So I kind of play around with colors first, and then they'll start to form into like people or beings to me and then that starts to form into the narrative to yeah. me um and that then i circle back and go into like is this a bigger narrative that i want to talk about you know or is this something that's going to be like a one shot for maybe a show i'm doing that needs a couple paintings or but they're all it still comes derived from this this fictional universe i have um so then it's it's really about trying to experiment and see what how these colors how these textures how these patterns can kind of come together and am I happy with the way it looks? And then I kind of, you know, go back digitally and and using Procreate, fill in stuff and, and experiment so I don't waste time or paint, um, which I've learned from experience that like, you know, digital tools really helped me with not wasting a lot of material um, along with having a small space to paint in. And then I kind of let, you know, the painting come out, but then I also leave a little leeway to experiment with it, to add little gestures of, other textures or to, um, you know, add little types of details that necessarily weren't in the sketch. Um, but I also have a long going, an ongoing like thing where I also occasionally like I write out what I'm painting about, which helps me to kind of bring the ideas full circle and bring the bigger picture of what I'm doing. Um, like what I'm working on right now is, is a, is a story about uh, abuse and trauma, and it's centered on a, a, a planet that's just filled with lot, like volcanoes everywhere. And there is an actual moon um, uh, called Io that's it, 
one of Jupiter's moons and it's completely covered with volcanoes. And so that was like my brain lit up when I, you know, read it, read about that. And that's something I want because just how even lava, how we were talking before about the Hulk yeah. lava, right? It's like pressure underneath and then it builds and blows up. And so I think for me, again, a lot of those symbolic metaphors that that relate to emotion, I can see in the lava and, and having that 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 narrative with that. So, um, yeah. Thank you. That's that's great. I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of I'm trying to maintain not marking out and being a nerd the way you just described that because I, I dug it. I really did. <laughs> um, so I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, the, the community component, right? Because you know I try to have this focus in this podcast in terms of it's like arts, culture, and community, but it's you know it's not the typical sort of thing. So I want to get a sense of like how if at all, like the West Coast, like you're, you're based in Oakland, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how, how does that, you know, are you within the sort of scenes? I know folks, some folks are like, nah, not out there. But in what ways mm -hmm. is like the local like arts community or being like West Coast based, like influence or impact any of the work that you're putting out, whether it is you go to a certain place or you're at the beach, it's like, I bring my sketch pad with me. I'm able to kind of do these certain things. In what ways does like, the, the sort of the locale you're in, um, like impact and in, in, in influence your work? Um, wow. Uh, so I, I've grown up here in the Bay Area, yeah. uh, specifically I grew down south and, and I've been in Oakland for, for about 14, 15 years now. Um, and, you know, my father is from um, a historically black community in San Francisco, um, uh, the Fillmore District. And so a lot of that influences in my work with with um you know i think growing up in the bay area being biracial but also growing up primarily my younger years in san jose which is has a lot more mexican influence and you know for being biracial and, and being mexican i think a lot of influence came from that with with things like um uh, Aztec Codex, you know, the, the, the Mesoamerican artwork and, and also just, you know, um, in terms of family members I've had, like even like old school lettering and, 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 and you know, just gangster culture, culture because my cousins were and, and that's something that I thought was cool when I was young. But also in terms of me being half black and my dad's experience and, and growing up in the Bay Area and, and also being in Oakland so long and seeing um, how race and how class ties into things are are hugely, I think, an influence on my work and, and how some of the characters interact with each other. Um, there is an old film um, from the, I think, 70s called Fantastic Planet, and that was a huge inspiration to me. I used to watch that with my mom, but just about how, like, it was a sci-fi thing, but it was about so much about class. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've tried to sometimes... You know, I get inspired by a lot of things, but really does inspire me is stuff that I see, um, you know, you know, as much as I do love Oakland, Oakland has gone through a lot of changes and a lot of those changes have been with the money that has come in here. And those changes always are, you know, when some people come in, people have to leave. And I think sometimes talking about these things and bringing up these issues are can feel like you're kind of beating in a dead horse and like, you know, how many times are we going to keep bringing this up? And that's what led me to like creatively wanting to create like some type of science fictional story around that. Yeah. So that, you know, and, and, and almost in the likes of, of, of authors who have done it, like uh, Octavia Butler and, and having these, these, these stories that like can be so impactful to our everyday and what I'm experiencing when I go out and I see, you know, uh, you know, in the same breath, if I go out and get a cup of coffee, I can see a person that's on the street in the tent and I can have so many emotions that day from experiencing those, that one experience of going to the coffee shop and then right down the street, I see someone who probably couldn't even afford that coffee. And why is that, that that's what relates back into, well, what, how do I want to tell a story or how am I going to, is that person going to come up in, in my universe? And I think that is something that, you know, from, from my dad, who is, you know, he's passed, but he was a huge like big fish kind of guy where he told these really crazy stories about the Fillmore district, about growing up in a, a, a black community that is actually gone, which a lot of people really don't know about um, the Fillmore district in San Francisco. It's, there's not a lot of people who are from that era in time still. You know, most of my family that was in San Francisco moved down to San Jose. Um, a lot of gentrification, a lot of things have changed. 
And I think a lot of, you know, the the issues around, I think even talking about these things is is because they create they create, you know, uncomfortableness with people because these are things that affect people. They affect the people moving in and they affect the people that are getting kicked out, but they still need to be talked about. And I think that is what inspires me is how can I create these like fictional stories, you yeah. know, uh, to bridge that gap and to get someone to understand this side and this person to understand that side or people to come together. Um, and, and stuff like that. I mean, like, like a Tavia Butler, like I said, or even my big thing is, is deep space nine, um, which I don't know a lot of people know about deep space nine, but deep space nine is a huge, uh, cultural to me phenomenon for one there's there's lots of black people on that show um, who are giving powerful roles and a lot of the 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 situations and experiences and stories in that show yeah. have very direct ties to what we experience as people of color as people who are other as people who are even trying to do something uh, worthwhile in our lives so I think you know for me um, that's that's what I get a lot from Oakland is 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 really just seeing um, how different the multitude of different experiences we're all having, but also, you know, the the narratives that we all tell ourselves. You know, some of us tell, you know, some people gentrification is good, but, you know, because we're getting money this way, and some people know it's totally bad. But I think all aspects of everything have dual sides to it, and that's partly for me what I feel like. I guess my charge is is to try to show as truthfully and honest my perspective, but not to be like. Like I'm not going to get on a soapbox and, and 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 preach to somebody, but I just want people to see the facts that I see, but in a way that like they'll be open to maybe receptiveness, you know, and re- open to like, oh, I didn't really think about that before. Oh, well, I get this. How does that relate to you know this person you know on the street or or, or or this person being kicked out of the house? And like, how do you make those connections? And how do we, you know, keep this? I think narrative of trying to make it, the human experience better without necessarily beating people down their throats or allowing them to come to the terms of where they want to educate themselves and not forcing it on them, so. No, that's, that's good. I, I, I think if you know, something catches someone's attention, and, and I, I try to do it here in, in doing this podcast, you know, it came out of, um, we had a f- former president talk really ill of Baltimore, and mm. uh, Baltimore is it's like 70% black. So I was like, no, what you mean is this. So just say what you mean. And that kind of activated me to through storytelling, through interviewing, I think, artists and folks that don't get the chance to share their story or share their story in a way that's not trying to accomplish all of these other things. Just like the truth is the truth. You know, that's mm-hmm. one of those sort of key motivators for me and doing it in this sort of moment in time in this documentarian way and coming up on, you know, four or four years of doing this and, you know, seeing sort of like the the growth in, in terms of the podcast, but also the types of conversations that are happening and maybe something back in 2019 when it started that may not still apply now. And it's like, oh, yeah, that place is closed or just seeing sort of the changes, but having it documented by the people who are living it and being around it, seeing these waves of gentrification and these waves of this is the shift or this is how we're thinking through these things when it comes to race or socioeconomic status, gender, all of these different things that move at such a breakneck pace at times. But it seems it has that sort of impression, but at times it seems like it's not moving quick enough or far enough at a time at an increment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, for me, uh, I've heard people say stuff like, okay, you know, uh, stuff like, you know, down with the police and, and, and why, why should we do that? And, 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 and why are these people still protesting and doesn't do anything or why is this? And I think it's, you know, consciousness is, is however you fight it. And, and, and I think some people, you know, they have an the avenue of, of being political. They have an avenue of, of being a, maybe a radical and they can, you know, do protests. But I think there are a lot of people, too, where I've seen the most power of, of, of it is, is in genuine, you know, self to self, you know, interpersonal conversations, mm-hmm. conversations we have with our friends, conversations we have with, you know, our, our, our you know, people we work with, conversations we have just interpersonally with people who are like vulnerable enough to show their ignorance to you. I've, I've, I've had, you know, being 
being biracial and being uh, black and Mexican, um, I've had the experience of, of being on both sides of, of, of having people who were black and maybe said something that was ignorant towards my Mexican side and, and maybe some of you were Mexican and they said something ignorant to my black side, but not realizing mm -hmm. that my consciousness enveloped both of those experiences. And I think I've had to learn to not look at people as like they're a bad person, that they just don't understand this part or they don't understand that part. But I think the frustration we do feel as people of color, um, the frustration I feel as as uh, a Mexican man, as a black man, as 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 an artist, as a black artist, is sometimes that we can't keep having the conversation. It's like if 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 it gets uncomfortable, then that means the conversation's over. And my in my eyes, that's when the conversation's getting good. <laughs> you know, that's we need to have these conversations because it is to sit there. I mean, James Baldwin was very famous for saying. You know, first he said, you know, it was going to end in my, my father's time. Then you're going to say it's going to end in my time and I'm still waiting. And I think that's partially the frustration we can feel about not being seen as human beings or as creatives or as people of color is, is the stories we're telling people aren't listening. They, they hear it, but they're not really listening to what we're saying. And I think that's the, you know, some of the patience that I think everybody needs to have, which is patience to understand what they're saying, but patience to let people feel the weight of what you're saying. Because I've, I've been in, you know, conversations just about race and class and, and come to conflict with people, I think because they assume because if we're all working at the same place, that we all come from the same place, or if we're all um, going for art that necessarily that we all had the same artistic background and it's what I found very interesting is is how different that can be and how different people's starting points and where they can be in their lives or what fired them up or enacted them to like I want to create something can all be different charges and I think there is no wrong way just the same way um, there isn't no wrong approach to battling ignorance but you have to find out what works for you and for me I found I'm not a good person to go out and I've gone to protests. Um, that's not for me. For me, that's why I do it in my work because that's where I have this passion and this wanting to connect. And that's to me where my power is not in, you know, um, you know, we need people who are out there doing those things as well, but we also need the people who have power, you know, even the Black Panthers had an artist, Emery Douglas, yeah. who's, you know, so it's like everybody has their own avenue and you just have to also know that the avenue you're choosing to has value that what you're contributing to the conversation doesn't have to be something that is is so blaringly like making change but even the smallest thing does ripple and cause change if you're having these conversations truthfully with other people yeah great and and i think that that has answered sort of that last question that i had so thank you you made, you made my job a little easier right there so i appreciate you on that one <laughs> <laughs> So, no problem. So now I want to shift into sort of the, um, I like to say the uh, dessert portion of the podcast. Uh, we got through the main course, the appetizer. Now it's trying to get to the rapid fire portion. So I got five rapid fire questions. Um, and I, as I like to tell everyone, don't overthink them. They're goofy questions. Mm. But, you know, some of them may have come from things you said earlier that I'm like, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. So okay. here's the first one. Here's the first one. And this is, I think, a challenge for the, the art type or the artist type. They always give me three, four, five. What is your favorite color? <laughs> Red. See, you, see you, you answered. I like that. I like that. So I'm like, well, it depends. Hmm. I was like, all right, cool. Okay. Uh, what is your go-to comfort food? We all have, like, something that you had a kind of a day that you're like, ugh. And for me, it's like Indian food or something like that. I'm like, hell yeah, this is going to be great. Get um, some chicken tikka masala or, you know, with a naan and a samosas. It's just like, it's time for the feast. Let's get in. What is that go-to comfort food for you? Mine is 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 just a regular bacon cheeseburger. Um, no matter what country I've even been to, I've been to several countries, I always still get a bacon cheeseburger because to me, that is like home. <laughs> That's like, uh, if it was a choice between, um, you know, someone was like a million dollars before you die or, or the most delicious cheeseburger you could ever have, cheeseburger, hands down. Hands I love that down. answer. I love that answer. Uh, let's see. Um, what is, um, 
Well, you said you, you mentioned you've been in multiple countries. Which been your uh, the favorite country you visited? Uh, probably Mexico. Uh, just because I have cultural ties there, I have family there, and so that was like, I've yet to go to to Africa, but I'm assuming I would have the same type of like feeling of like you know, I mean, when I saw even Black Panther and and the opening scene and they're coming over Wakanda and that they're, they're singing music, I damn, I cried in the theater, man. I was like, man, <laughs> if I when I go to Africa, that's gonna be holding. But yeah, Mexico was like probably for that reason, the, the culture ties of it being in a place that like not only was old, but I felt like I belonged there. Mm -hmm. was blew my mind more than any other place I've been. That's great. All time favorite movie. Ooh, I know. Ooh. I, know. I would say favorite movie. It would be across man. Just one. Well, two, two big favorite movies of mine that I've seen a lot are aliens and Shawshank Redemption. Those are the two that are popping up for me right now. Um, uh, there's a whole, I mean, I could go on a whole list of other movies, but those, those, those are ones I pop, I will still listen to watch while I'm painting just to like have in the background sometimes just cause I love how they make me feel. Yeah. But I, I might do a movie review podcast and I might've did um, a review on aliens hint, hint, wink, wink. <laughs> oh man. That's, that's, I mean, Ridley Scott for one is just to, I mean, not the second one, but definitely Ridley Scott is what got me into it. But aliens is, is all time. I mean, if he, if you don't like that movie, I don't know. <laughs> so, this got to be a, a, little, a little off. I don't know. Because that movie, I just can't see. Like, that movie is just classic to me. 100%. So this is the last one. And I, I usually, I used to play, I'll, I'll share this with you because I think you might like it. I think you might find it funny. Um, I, I would like to go into coffee shops and make an order. And they would ask me, like, do I want cream, whatever in it. And I would like, I would say, I want this much cream and I would describe it as the skin color of a particular black black person. I was like, yeah, hey, I want right. to get I want to get the coffee, but I want it to look like Malcolm X. And it usually is a white person. <laughs> and they look at me like, you're a jerk, you're a jerk, you're a jerk. So, <laughs> but generally I get a I get a red eye generally. So describe yeah. your coffee order. Like what do you like like to get? Because you mentioned coffee a few times. What do you like to drink? Like is it a particular type? Is it just I like, you know, regular black coffee? What's your coffee order? Um well I usually do, yeah, Malcolm X coffee. Um or you know, I used to do I used to do a Wesley Snipes coffee, but that was I think I got too much into uh uh just I, I like the I like having just like a latte or a coffee with cream. That's that's my main thing. But you know, no more, you know, Wesley Snipes coffee for me. Um and usually I, I have to have something sweet with it. Like that's that's been something I've been trying to break as I get older is not have you know, the pastry or the donut, yeah. but it's just like, you can't do that. It's like a, a bacon cheeseburger with no fries, man. It's like, it doesn't go. It's, right. it's, but I'm, I'm after that the next time I order coffee, I might have to say, I need a, I need a Malcolm X coffee. <laughs> Please do. Please do. They're going to look at you like, what do you say? I, um, usually I'll get really strong coffee, whatever it is. I'm always adding a shot of espresso at least. And, um, mm -hmm. That, that combination that I like, and I don't do it all the time, but if it's there and it's like, I haven't eaten anything, I'm usually going to get like uh, the coffee and a Queen Amon. And I like rip pieces off, dip it in there. It's like, you almost get that really strong, bitter coffee flavor. In addition to the super sweet and buttery Queen Amon, it slaps. It is delicious. Oh, wow. I, I'm, I'm big on a coffee cake. Uh, my grandmother used to make this old school, like delicious, coffee cake. Um, and so that's like a go-to for me when I have like, you know, and, and I try, I mean, I've been better at like eating more vegan stuff, but there is nothing like a home, just oily, greasy donut with, yeah. oh man, just, in fact, that might even, that's the second, that's a, that's the second close to bacon cheeseburger is donut and like a big, nice cup of coffee. You yeah. can, you can just, Tie my eyes up, shoot me now, take me out. I'm good to go. Because that's like, man, you're speaking my language right now. That's that's it, that's my food language. Nice. It's. I, I remember I had one of the coolest moments, and this will be the last thing before we do the closing remarks. Uh, I remember I had this moment with my uh, my nephew. Um, I I was we, 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 I gave him some like some some cash or what have you, you know, just kind of trying to impart wisdom around money or what have you. He's he's a teenager. He's like 13, 14. And um, mm -hmm. 
we end up going to this the, the Amish market where they use the real butter and the real items when it comes to making donuts. And mm. we're in there and I was like, you want some donuts? He's like, yeah. I was like, man, that money that I just gave you, you're spending that before we leave here. This is for you to enjoy yourself. Like, can't always save it. So let's just do it. And he was like, I do want a donut. Mm. And I was like, cool, let's do it. And we go over there and um, he's ordering some donuts. And he was like, so what's your favorite donut? And I was like, it's a blueberry cake donut. I love a blueberry cake donut. And in a moment of sort of sheer, um, I, I guess it warmed the cockles of my heart. He was like, I'm gonna get two of these. I'm gonna get one for my uncle. Get the blueberry cake donut. And I was like, huh? I was like, I don't know what to feel about that. I was like, don't do that. <laughs> but thank you. It was a really, really sweet moment. And it was that sort of exchange. But yeah, blueberry cake donut. That is my go-to. I need to, I need to find me a blueberry cake donut. It's delicious. So that's pretty much it for me in the this podcast here. So one, I want to thank you for for coming on and spending some time with me and, and sharing a bit of your story and just, just the different things that are baked into it. And, and secondly, I want to invite and encourage you to share with the listeners where they can follow you, check out your work, all of that good stuff, social media, website, all of that good stuff. The floor is yours. Um, you can find me at, you know, my website is santosheltonart.com. Um, but the best place to keep up with me is is my Instagram, which is just santosart. Um, and uh, I'll be doing a show uh, in August uh, in a gallery in Portland called Gallery Ergo. And then um, I actually have another interview that's come up with a gallery called Moth Belly Gallery in San Francisco, where they did a magazine interview with me. Um, so check that out if you, if you want to know more about my word <laughs> world that I create from. Um, but yeah, I appreciate, you know, you let me tell my story. And, and um, um, earlier today, I was just checking out one of your previous uh, podcasts and, and yeah, man, keep doing what you're doing. It's, 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 it was really inspiring. And, and I love just listening and hearing about, you know, everyone's different perspective and why they create and, and where they're coming from, because I think that's just something we, we also lose as creatives is we don't really know um, everyone's story out there. We just see a little blip here and a little show there, but we don't really know why you do it, where you do it, how you do it, why do you keep on doing it? And definitely I didn't know about no blueberry cake, you know, uh, donuts. So uh, <laughs> win, win for me. That's great. And there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Santos Shelton for coming on to the podcast and sharing a bit of his story and a bit of his background and just, just being a dope guest. And I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, and community in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Oh,